Nice to see you all. Thank you, David Amaro. We are live. Elio, the myth, the legend. Thank you, Anthony Joachim. I hope everybody's having an absolutely phenomenal end to their week. We're going to be breaking down a ton of news on this episode, helping you understand the macro landscape, not just of essentially this week in crypto, but what is the next phase of this crypto bull run, this DeFi-fueled bull run? What does it look like? Are we running out of steam? Is the macro landscape around Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies going to change for the better over the coming days and weeks? And how can you position yourself for the times ahead? Today, we're going to be talking about what I think as absolutely critical news and then getting to some interesting tips and tricks that I've been using to maximize some gains on Uniswap so I can really juice the most out of my altcoins. I think you guys are going to absolutely love this one. In addition, we're going to be talking about what you should be looking at or what I'm looking at, rather, just my strategy, not financial advice, as to what is the next play here in alt season, which I know that this is going to be something you guys are going to absolutely love. So if you're excited, if you feel like you're going to get some value out of today's episode, do me a favor and destroy that like button, obliterate it, make sure the thing just breaks and doesn't come back, please. And then let's get, let's get this whole thing started. 331, 337. If we smash up these likes, we can get the numbers up even faster and more people can benefit from this content. So I'd appreciate if you guys give me a little like spike. All righty, let's hop in to the news of the day. Right now, we're looking at a little bit of a breather. And I think we need to understand a few things about the way the crypto market is working right now for us to really understand where this initial bull run came from here in crypto land and what we can look for as far as the next few weeks and months. So I'm going to hop over to my window view. I'm going to put this filter on myself so it cuts me down. I'm going to get this window capture going. Alrighty. So the title of today's stream comes from an article that's covering a comment, a tweet put out by the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which is, of course, a book written by Robert Kiyosaki back in the 90s. And this became almost a cult-like investment thesis, investment advice. This informed generation about wealth management and how you can get ahead in today's modern financial world. It focused a lot on real estate, but Robert Kiyosaki is widely considered a financial icon. And to a lot of people, whether or not he made the most money from selling his books or selling private mentorship, he had some kind of you know controversy. A lot of people still regard him as an incredibly positive influence on their own business career. And for that reason, that's why he's so influential. Uh, he tweeted, Fed and Treasury to take over banking system? Fed, Treasury, helicopter, fake money, direct to people to avoid mass rioting? Not a time to think about it. How much gold, silver, and Bitcoin do you have? And so this is essentially the crux of what we're going to be discussing here, which is if the economy is not able to make any kind of meaningful recovery, and we're not able to see a cohesive plan developed by the Congress, by the essential leadership in the United States, then what's going to happen is most likely going to be a banking crisis. The reason for that is because, well, no one's going to be paying their loans back to the bank. Essentially what the bank does primarily is loan money. They invest money, they loan money, but for the most part, a big part of their balance sheet is all the money that they are owed. Never forget that all of your money is not in the bank. In fact, a very, very small fraction of your money is actually kept inside the bank. For the most part, they loan that out to others. It's called fractional reserve banking, and it's one of the reasons why our modern banking system is so vulnerable to extreme collapses. Because essentially, if everyone wants to go and get their money out all at once, well, there's not enough money for that to happen. So the bank has to essentially, kind of like a gym membership, expect that only a certain amount of people are going to want to use its services at a time. You know, gyms have something like over 100x the amount of members that they could fit in the building. It's kind of the same thing, where they just know that most people sign up for a gym and they never go and use it. Most people put their money in a bank and they never try to take it out. 
Uh, and so this is what's going on, is essentially Robert Kiyosaki is putting forth the theory that we could see a tremendous collapse of our banking system in the next few months or years, and that this fiat money, this US dollar, is going to be seen as fake money. People are not going to have faith in it. And if there is ever a moment where it is widely understood that you can no longer get your money out of the banks here in the United States, well, that's going to send absolute shockwaves through the global economy. But more importantly, we're going to see a surge of interest in Bitcoin and alternative or sound money assets like gold, silver, and Bitcoin like never before. But what's important to remember is that what's happened with Bitcoin is not a bull run, not yet. It's bullish, it's had a bullish recovery. But if you look back at my episode with Mike McGlone from Bloomberg from just a few days ago, probably about a week and a half now, he explains that the, the, uh, the gold and Bitcoin bull runs have not even yet begun. Although gold's at all time highs, although Bitcoin is nearing not, I guess, all time highs, but the amount of days it's been in the price territory that it's at right now, above 10K, above 12K, that is for the most part near all-time highs. There's only been a few moments in Bitcoin's history that it's been valued this high. And so you could say that it's looking very bullish, but the reality is that these assets are designed to perform in a inverse way from the traditional markets. And right now, traditional markets are at all-time highs, almost eerily high in the terms of how much these traditional like NASDAQ, S&P 500 markets are being valued at. That's why a lot of people are calling for a collapse of these sort of stock market valuations. A lot of people are looking for meaningful pullbacks. And in reality, this is setting up a very, very interesting move as we've had what can only be described as a period of non-stop euphoria in the DeFi-fueled altcoin market. So let's try to break down on this episode what's going on from a macro perspective, what kind of macro factors could affect Bitcoin, and why Bitcoin not really moving while these other coins are doing 10, 20, 100x. If you're looking at coins like TrustSwap, which are really building off of the back of this decentralized world that has taken flight on Ethereum. If you're looking at that world and you're looking at the story of Bitcoin, which has done about a 2x since its collapse back in March, those are wildly different stories, right? Bitcoin just essentially doing about a 50% growth over its previous value that it was valued at before the coronavirus collapse. And so you're not seeing the same behavior on Bitcoin that you're seeing on the, gen on the altcoin DeFi market. And we're going to talk about that. One of the ironic twists here is that banks are actually standing to make a lot of money from this crisis because they're essentially the filter that has decided how to allocate all of the uh, coronavirus stimulus funds. Remember the Paycheck Protection Program that made its way to such starving entities as Yale and other types of multi-million dollar companies that actually turns out wouldn't have needed to go without these jobs. They wouldn't have left people without payment in the first place. So it's important to realize that banks, uh, as much as the stimulus flows, could actually you know, profit tremendously from this, or if we're seeing gridlock and we see an end to the political will to essentially helicopter the economy and keep printing our way out of it, which I could see coming from a variety of factors. I really only see two different paths to nonstop stimulus. Um, and I'm not even going to go into that right now because that's not the point of this episode. But the point is whether stimulus continues or not is going to me to be the big dictator here as to whether banks essentially are rolling in this newly printed money or whether they could be on the brink of essentially a bank run and people losing faith in the system. Of course, this is a little bit of a doomsdayer kind of uh, analysis. I tend to try to stay away from extremely, uh, you know, uh, extreme situations because that's typically not the way things play out. But in reality, this is not outside of the realm of possibility. And this would, of course, drive a lot of people into Bitcoin. But I wanted to talk for a second about Metcalf's Law because there was a tweet by a Twitter account called DGen Spartan, and they put up a tweet today saying, hey, by the way, I have not seen one normie no-coiner convert a single dollar worth of fiat into this crypto bull run at any point yet. And I think that that's really important to realize is that this has been an altcoin season that has come from essentially the insiders. It's been big whales within the crypto community driving the game 
gains up on these smaller coins. And meanwhile, Bitcoin is barely even moving. So how do we explain this? How do we explain how Bitcoin's barely moving, but we're getting these crazy altcoin trends? And that to me just completely smells of these whales trying to pump their own pags. And that's what essentially DeFi is, is you take a pretty much non-productive asset, which is just a hard capped cryptocurrency, and then you put it into a yield earning pool, and all of a sudden you have a productive asset. And so it made sense to me that this would excite the sort of stagnant money bags that have been sitting around the hundreds of billions of dollars sitting around in cryptocurrency, specifically those Bitcoin bags that are worth more than any other, pretty much all of them combined. And then you, you take those Bitcoin bags, tokenize them, put them in DeFi, and you get this whole new wave of excitement. And by doing that, you created all of these uh, platform tokens. But essentially, we're ignoring the biggest issue here, which is Metcalf's law. Metcalf's law says that a network's value is proportional to the square number of its nodes in the network. For example, if a node has, if a network has 10 nodes, its inherent value is 100, 10 squared. What it, essentially Metcalf's law is intended to explain is the exponential growth of networks. Now we know that throughout 2016 and 2017, the amount of new Bitcoin address, the amount of new Bitcoin addresses, which is a data point that my friend Mike McGlone over at Bloomberg on all of our episodes likes to bring up as one of the highest correlations to the increase in Bitcoin price. That particular correlation is important because we're looking at a network effect here, a network effect dictated by the total quantity of people in the network. And I can personally attest to the fact that not a single one of my normie friends, my no coiner friends have hit me up this cycle saying, hey, what's this DeFi thing? Nobody. So it leads me to believe that there is a lot of action, essentially, people within the crypto community that have created this new wave of excitement. And maybe that's the way it's supposed to start. But it's important to realize that Bitcoin hasn't moved because its network has not grown. And that network multiplier is the critical factor in understanding when this, you know, the, the bigger ship is going to move. And so you're seeing here, you know, we have buy crypto, and I'm gonna uh, minimize this again, uh, but you're seeing buy crypto here as uh, searches over time, and we're seeing that in January 2018, we got obviously 100 read, and we're here barely clocking a 20 read. But if you see throughout the middle of 2017, we're still making almost the same type of growth towards this big sort of blow off top that we had. Uh, but we're nowhere close to the same uh, the levels of interest, even if the uh, record number of accounts and activity going on on Binance already resembles those 2017 levels. Uh, my point here is that the network isn't growing, even if some of these market caps, these lower market caps are growing. And I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I haven't done a lot of gem videos lately because I haven't found a lot of gems lately. And that's because it seems like this DeFi craze has started to create a little bit of a race to the bottom where coins like Yam and other meme coins are captivating a disturbing amount of market capital, a disturbing amount of economic activity. And the big coins, the awesome coins, the DeFi majors or the blue chips, as we call them here in the DeFi land, have sort of already mooned, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 X or more. And so they sort of have given their opportunity for the minute. And without another wave of interest, most people are just looking for micro caps. And so that's why we've been looking at micro caps. And, you know, while this DeFi bull run takes a breather, I'm going to be explaining my strategy for how I'm approaching altcoins for the next few weeks. So before we get into that, I wanted to explain this because people don't actually know about this. And I thought that this would be a, a, a really nice sort of lesson for me to walk you guys through, which is providing liquidity on Uniswap and how profitable it could be and how you can calculate it. So this article is entitled, How Profitable Can Liquidity on Uniswap? Uh, how Profitable is U Providing Liquidity on Uniswap? Really, centralized exchanges are less secure. And on decentralized exchanges, users have control of their funds. DEXs uh, are private, no KYC. You guys know all this, right? Uh, as you can see, the volume on Uniswap has been nothing short of staggering of late with you know over $200 million in daily volume each day now. Absolutely bonkers, this stuff. Um, what I really wanted to shine a light on is this right here. This person did an experiment where they tried out uh, providing liquidity 
uh, for the Ohm token. Now, the Ohm token is the white hot new MontraDAO token that's part of the Polkadot ecosystem, hitting every buzzword right on the head, and it got everyone really excited. And so, what they said is uh, they invested uh, 2.4 ETH for 400 and uh, 4,164 uh, Ohm tokens at a value of 2,126 dollars. Three days later, they had $3,027. They received $350 in fees, meaning a $550.21 uh, pr uh, price return, 25.8%, and a 16% Uniswap ROI within three days. Of course, this is important to realize this is not going to be your standard results because the Ohm token was by all means an over-indexer in the amount of liquidity, the amount of volume that went through that liquidity pool and still is going through. And so they put together this tool uh, that helps you understand uh, liquidity pools and the Uniswap ROI. So what they compare here, because there is risk in providing liquidity, and it comes in the form of something called impermanent loss. So if you guys understand the form of impermanent loss and what that means, then great. If not, you're going to have to look it up on your own because it's something that I don't want to include here. But just understand this is one of the factors, is you have impermanent loss, and it can either be... Uh, uh, positive or negative. It doesn't have to be negative. Or can, can it be positive? I don't see any positive numbers here. But anyway, you have impermanent loss, and then you have fees. Then you have your Uniswap ROI, which shows what your yield versus just holding would have been considering all of these factors. And so what we see here is that the ETH uh, Ocean, uh, this liquidity pool on 30 days, was an absolute monster rep uh, returning a 40% yield over just holding, right? Oh, let me make my uh, head a little smaller here. Sorry, guys. So we see here that the ETH Ocean pool here returns. Here, let me actually, yep, make this smaller. Sorry about that. We're seeing that the ETH Ocean pool here returned 40% over just holding. And that is beastly because I put Ocean on my August coins list to watch because I said it was very likely to get a Coinbase listing and that the project was a beast in and of itself. And this, whoever listened to that advice, you are welcome because that was probably one of my better coin picks ever. Uh, definitely all the coins this month mooned, but Ocean did some serious work. Finding out that you could have done over the same period of time an additional 40% growth by putting it in the liquidity pool is absolutely monstrous. So I wanted you guys, uh, I wanted you guys to essentially see this as an opportunity. Um, there's also ETH Ohm, which is the next highest uh, yield of all the coins. And as we go down, essentially, you can see that you know these are high, high performers, whereas the average is making here about a couple of percent, right? A couple of percent or break even, uh, even negative yields, I believe. Uh, nope, or it's not showing any, at least on this chart. Anyway, so that's the point here is that you can actually increase your yields here. Obviously, there is some risk, uh, but some of these high performers, the more trending coins, uh, it's worth considering looking into adding liquidity to these liquidity pools. And if you guys are interested in learning about those liquidity pools, then do me a favor and smash that like button. And of course, leave me a comment in the comment section below. So now we're going to talk about the Ethereum 2 Medela testnet, which essentially people are saying, or the ETH2 researchers are saying that this will not delay ETH2. It won't delay ETH2, and that essentially all of these bugs are part of why they do testnets. Now, personally, I, uh, I have a high confidence that ETH2 will launch. But essentially, this uh, big bug that happened on the testnet is something that essentially they've stabilized, they figured out where it came from, and they still have, uh, they're saying they still have hope, they're back up to 40%, but they need over 66% participation to finalize. So if you have the ability to help stabilize this network, you have the technical savvy to help participate in this testnet, do us all a favor and help out because they need a few more uh, participants here. Um, but I still believe that after all these years, ETH2 has a high likelihood of scaling. I believe in Val Vitalik and the team. And if they don't, it's just going to open the door big time for other players. So the show does go on, right? The show does go on. But I do have a feeling that ETH2, even if it takes a few extra months, that's going to be the big ship, right? All these other uh, environments or these ecosystems are exciting to think about. But I still am a big believer in ETH2. I'm still a big believer that 
the, the crowd has spoken. They'd much rather pay ridiculous fees than go over and migrate to another platform. Even with all of the, the, the lack of development on Ethereum, the lack of progress on Ethereum over the recent years, all the Ethereum killers have really failed to take the trust that Ethereum has built. And people misunderstand that trust is a function of time. And so Ethereum's trust outstrips all of these Ethereum killers by a long, long measure. And so even Polkadot, which I'm really excited for, I still believe that Polkadot's biggest asset is that they will take Ethereum and make Ethereum better, offload some of the computation power from Ethereum, but I don't think it replaces Ethereum, right? I think we need Ethereum to scale and we need Polkadot and they can all play in harmony. Okay, we also have XRP essentially being claimed that it's not a security by a congressman. And this just makes me laugh because I'm like, is this guy holding bags of XRP? At any rate, uh, this is just an interesting step forward for the crypto industry to be getting more attention in Congress. And of course, the more assets that we have declared as not securities, I believe it's healthier for the space overall. So if you guys agree with that, do me a favor and smash that like button. We also have this, that the IRS essentially has moved the question of whether or not you use cryptocurrencies to the top of their IRS form uh, ahead. Uh, the cryptocurrency question is now front and center on the IRS form 1040 for next year. Pretty clear that it shows the IRS is taking cryptocurrency taxes even more seriously. Again, uh, I heard Ivan do a segment on this, but if you guys are looking for help with your crypto taxes, I'll do my best to try to bring some people to the frame here, some experts, but you definitely, if you're doing a lot of trading, you want to get a professional to do those taxes. You want to prepare those correctly because you don't want to set yourself up for an audit. That would not be fun stuff for you. And in the end, uh, yeah, you should you should just be aware that this is a change coming to the ecosystem, that this is going to be an increased level of scrutiny. Again, with that increased level of scrutiny, there's also the development and the progress of the overall industry. We also have OMG doing some crazy growth as essentially the scalability around Ethereum becomes a hotbed issue that pretty much takes center frame. We have scaling solutions already on Ethereum and they will continue to grow in their effectiveness, especially as Ethereum grows in its own scalability. Those layer twos will become like exponential rocket fuel for that. But now we've seen OMG, which was, in my opinion, almost a dead project, soar after the Ethereum congestion just reached its peak. OMG did, I think, uh, at least 100%. I, I saw upwards of 500%. Uh, gosh, where is that statistic here? Uh, but OMG has been, oh, here it is. OMG is up almost 500% over the year. And the reality is that this is just showing how much the market will start valuing these uh, second layer scaling solutions. We can look at other projects like Matic, projects like OMG, projects like Loom, even though Loom is a little bit of a zombie project, the founder left, as I understand. Um, but you can see here that scaling is going to start taking the center stage because we need Ethereum to perform as DeFi has reignited the desire to use that network at an absolute breakneck, break, breakneck pace. It hasn't stopped people putting billions of dollars locked into DeFi. But this is all setting the stage for what I'm going to be talking about in just a few minutes, which is how I'm going to play the next phase of this altcoin season. So if you guys are excited for that, you're going to be heavily rewarded because I think I have the right strategy for this next phase. 891 of us in this chat. Thank you guys all for watching. I hope you guys are all having a wonderful Friday. And I hope this information is helping you, helping you internalize and navigate this crazy world of cryptocurrency. I was going to talk about this YAM finance thing. Uh, I think it's a little boring. Let's just have a few memes. Let's throw a few memes in here. Thought this was funny. Somebody trying to mine on their laptop. Yeah, guys, mining can't be done on simple computers anymore. It's not 2011. Uh, and then this guy, this is a nice message. I huddled up to 20K, down to 3,800, back up to 11.8. So let me tell you that 11.8K feels friggin' fantastic. And being confident about what com what's coming next feels even better. Huddle on comrades, don't trade Bitcoin. I completely agree with this sentiment. Like, how many times has Bitcoin been pushed down and how many times has it bounced up? It's now in a territory that it's rarely been in. It's incredibly high priced territory given Bitcoin's life cycle. So I think that the perception that, you know, Bitcoin is doing anything other than what it's supposed to do is incorrect. And again, as we're talking about the potential for a banking collapse, obviously, I hope it doesn't come to that because I think that would be pretty ugly for all involved. But this is exactly what you want to understand is that Bitcoin is sound money. It is incredibly scarce. 
and that the bull run for Bitcoin can't really fully take place until there's a period of disdain in other asset classes, until there's a period of disdain towards the US dollar, for example, which, as we start to see here, we've started to see, where is that article? I had this up. All right, well, essentially the US dollar is weakening. It's weakening big time. Of course it would be weakening as they're printing trillions of dollars of it. I, I like to back everything up with an article, but anyway, I thought this was a nice thought. You have a restaurant essentially saying that Bitcoin is their prime reserve asset. If you want the world to adopt Bitcoin as reserve assets, start within, start within yourself. So I think this is a great message that if you have a business, if you are an individual, you can contribute to this movement by using Bitcoin as a reserve asset. And then here we have an interesting, uh, this was the original tweet I was talking about at the beginning of the segment, which is from DGen Spartan, where he said, where's all the retail? Not a simple normie, not a single, <clears throat> not a simple normie I know IRL has converted any fiat into crypto yet. And we have this sort of uh, long tweet storm here by Dovey Wan, Dovey Wan. She's a, uh, an early adopter. She was a bit, uh, I guess an eBay uh, alum, she was an early eBay person. Anyway, she's a tech tech person, heavily invested in the space, and so she's saying essentially have seen narratives as this bull run is going to be more fierce than 2017, and she's saying here's the antithesis. Uh, she's saying that essentially I'm not going to read all of this, but. All of this is internal activity. This is what I was talking about. And that there's not a big network expansion of all the people in crypto. There's just been a sort of fire lit at the lowest level of these altcoins. Yet the big money hasn't moved in. The big numbers haven't changed. It's only the smaller numbers that are changing, leading people to believe that these are either whales or insiders kind of moving the market as of now. And so that makes me feel like what we've seen here especially as we're looking at coins like TrustSwap reaching $100 million in market cap in what feels like absolutely no time, really. This coin was $0.005. So it was literally half a penny and it went up to $1.50, right? So you're looking at literally like a 300x depending if you on how you count it, right? And that's insane growth, right? Um, which to get this thing to grow anymore, you know, obviously I, I love TrustSwap and I'll be showing you one of their awesome updates, but you're thinking that we need to start bringing new people into the space, right? So what I'm doing is, you know, I'm very aware that over the last few weeks, people have been bringing me essentially lower and lower quality projects. I really look for gems. I look to, I listen to everything people are talking about. If you guys are not in my Telegram groups, you should join. Uh, T.me slash Elio Trades Crypto, links in the description. We talk about crypto in there at all, all hours of the night, and I do like to hear what the community is saying. I listen to what people on Twitter are saying. I join lots of communities, and I like to get a wide exposure, keep my ear to the streets, if you will. And over the progress, over the last few weeks, it went from amazing projects like Synthetics and Ren uh, to projects like Yam and projects uh, that are just essentially pump and dumps. And people have no understanding of fundamentals. They don't even worry about making a good looking website. It's like they're just using stock images and emojis. And I the, the race to the bottom, I feel like, is on right now, where essentially people are not even wanting to put their money in good coins because they've already pumped because they know that the only way to really get you know their 10x is to race to the bottom to get a, something just tiny in market cap. And so that makes me feel like really what we're at is a point where we need to uh, have a breather, a little bit of a cool off in the majors, a little bit of cool off in the mid caps. And that will essentially allow for, if you missed your entry into some of the best projects, I'm now looking to re-enter some of the best projects, get even bigger bags of the projects that I love. And I'm not really looking at these sub $3 million market caps right now because I haven't seen a project of tremendous quality in that range in the last several weeks. Uh, it hasn't been as easy to find those gems as it was before. And so that's sort of where I'm coming at this from is I've seen a, a bit of a race to the bottom. I've seen a lot of the newer DeFi projects coming out. They're starting to just copy each other and knock each other off so rapidly, so quick. Every day, another thing's pumping and dumping, and not, none of them are sticking for more than a few days. And so I feel like these new DeFi projects are less exciting, and that what we really need to do is focus on 
uh, supporting the good projects, making sure that you're in the projects that have a through line, that have users, that have wide functionality and utility. Uh, and if you're wondering which coins those are, we'll talk about those in just one second. And uh, this is obviously an update from uh, a quick update from TrustSwap. They're just adding on their launch pad a coin called SoftLink, which is essentially like Ampleforth type elastic supply stuff, but it's tied uh, to Chainlink. So they have, uh, instead of being tied to a dollar, they're tied to 0.1 chain link. And yeah, interesting stuff. Again, like I said, the Ampleforth tokenomics are amazingly exciting and they've gotten knocked off about as many times as a Gucci purse. So I don't know what to say, except these things, you know, the tokenomics are going to continue to be an interesting uh, differentiator, but tokenomics in and of themselves are not going to be the drivers of value. So I wanted to talk about a project that I actually really like, which is Swipe. And obviously Swipe is down a huge on the day from its peak here at almost $5. It's down to about 250, 260, right? Almost a 50% off sale here. And this is as Swipe partners with Band, uh, Band sorry, to launch their SwipeFi. They're doing some DeFi stuff. Obviously we know they're owned by Binance. I also heard rumors that they're having major banking partnerships and they're looking to launch in the United States. They just got the okay launch in the US. So as they're coming with this flood of amazing news, and of course we know that they're a beastly project backed by what I think of as the best founder in the space, Cheng Peng Xiao, um, we're looking at their integrations uh, through band protocol, how they're going to do their swipe fi stuff. You'd think that this would be rocket fuel for the DeFi community, but instead we get a dump, right? And so, uh, you know, I'm looking at a project more like XX. SXP as my next gem, right? Because when I covered Swipe initially, we covered Swipe, um, we covered Swipe, I believe, was it here? Yeah, it was like here. It was like uh, mid-July, right, right as it was first making its way up to $2. And so then it went on this massive run up to $5, but now we're almost back to $2, right? It's only 25% up from when we sort of first talked about it or 40%, right? So you're getting new entries back into projects that do have fundamentals. They have a real business model. They have real users that will use this. They have revenue streams and they have reasons to buy, hold, and lock up these tokens. And they're engaging in the hot trend, which is DeFi. So to me, looking at, a X, looking at SXP to get your hands on a, a bigger bag, a better entry position than maybe you had when it was up here mooning up to three, four, five dollars that's much more logical logical than trying to, I guess, get in on the next DeFi trash pump coin because I've become a little bit sick of these DeFi coins just saying we're DeFi with uh, this, with that. It's like, nah, don't just use a buzzword. Explain to me if you're going, people are saying, okay, we're going to be a DEX with DeFi, like a few of these projects. I'm not going to name them because I don't want to give them any shine. Uh, but if you're going to say that you're going to be a DEX, Tell me how you're going to be a better DEX than Uniswap, right? Tell me what you're offering that makes you better than what we already have. If you're going to be lending, tell me what makes you better than Compound or Maker or any of the other amazing platforms that we already have. Don't just throw buzzwords together. And then when I see a couple buzzwords and a huge, like crazy, multi-hundred percent pump on it within a few days... That to me is a sign that it's really just become a bit of a race to the bottom, right? It's it's total, total, uh, these are trash coins, right? So for me, looking at the state right now, I'm trying to actually evaluate better entries, bigger entries into the what I call the DeFi majors, the coins that I see staying after there's a, a forest fire that comes through the DeFi industry and really cleanses all of this trash. Uh, we're going to be seeing coins like SXP stay. We're going to see uh, coins like REN stay. We're going to see coins like Synthetics stay, I believe. And so I'm looking uh, to see if this dump continues uh, how can I get better entries into coins like that or coins that I see with amazing technology that haven't really gotten their big, uh, their big pump yet. But I'm not going to be doing any meme coins. I'm not going to be doing any DGen coins. And I just don't think that that's the right uh, way forward right now. It's a race to the bottom in my opinion. So if you guys agree with that message, if you like that message, do me a favor, smash that like button. Uh, yep, here we go. Swipe now available to US residents just a couple of days ago. And so I don't understand why this thing's dumping. It's just really strange the way crypto works like that. Um, but anyway, let's talk a little bit about these uh, DeFi coins. I like now that CoinGecko has a DeFi section on their site. 
And so, you know, I'm going to be looking right here uh, at some of the DeFi coins. You know, I'm I'm right now uh, have it uh, sorting by market cap. So you have Chainlink and Lend at the top, Synthetics at the top, Maker Compound all towards the top, Zero uh, X performing amazingly, right? Because this is the real tech that you actually have real utility and projects built upon. Like Zero X powers Coinbase's decentralized exchange, Paraswap, I believe is what it's called. At any rate, um, so I'm going to be looking at coins like Ren, coins like seeing how far band falls. Maybe band will fall down a little bit more, even though I kind of had my band bags packed. I got my uh, my moonshot off that. Um, but really looking at these top, top DeFi coins, uh, even Kava, right? Looking at, see how I can get even better entries into these coins, which I believe are going to come back with a vengeance at the next sort of wave of this bull run. Remember that bull runs are not straight lines. And I, I actually did a video saying how 99% of you will not get rich off of crypto because bull runs are just as emotional, if not more emotional than bear markets. Because bull runs make you think at various times that everything is going one way. And that at other times, they make you think that everything's going another way. And it's sometimes hard to see that you're on the way to the promised land. You're on the way to huge pumps. You're on the way to moonshot gains uh, because it's hard to see that when you're down, you know, say tens of thousands of dollars in a day. It hurts, right? It hurts. So uh, to me, that's my strategy for the next few days is if I can see this bleed continuing, I want to look at some coins that have over pumped and focus on them. Uh, more so than these sort of sub five million uh, dollar micro caps, uh, because I haven't seen any quality in that range of late. So I hope you guys, uh, I hope you guys uh, benefit from that perspective. And of course, as soon as I do see quality in the sub five million dollar market cap range, you guys will be the first to know. But I just haven't seen that. Right? There hasn't been another dia that has passed by my desk, or else I would have made a video. And we see Polkadot also doing pretty well, right? Polkadot's another extremely powerful narrative. Uh, and they are really not cooling off tremendously. All, obviously, they're down from about, what was this, uh, 318. Um, but yeah, these new DOT tokens, uh, just multiply that by 100, and that's what you get the old DOT price, right? So 290. Um, yeah, I, I believe that Polkadot has got a lot of hype, but I also do believe that there will be a lull in the Polkadot hype. And so I'm kind of looking for a lull in the hype uh, to maybe get a better entry because that's typically how things work, right? Like look at Swipe, you know, huge hype, huge pullback. Look at Trust Swap, huge hype, nice pullback, you know? And so Polkadot has been pretty much nonstop. And so I'm hoping that both coins like MantraDAO and Ohm and Polkadot, and there's a few other new coins coming to the Polkadot ecosystem I'll be talking about when they are a little more relevant. Uh, those are the types of coins I'm going to be trying to get into, trying to uh, get my entries when people aren't looking at them, when people are getting a little, uh, little turned off. Maybe a good example of this is Sora, even though I still think Sora is up pretty pretty massively, right? So you have Sora that came up from about $5 sitting up here about 79. Yeah, it's it's pretty, pretty, pretty big uh, on this pump. So yeah, if this comes down another leg, maybe to, gosh, if I can get it back down around these uh, $30 range, somewhere around there, maybe I'll come back in and try to get my entry into Sora. Uh, but still 24 million market cap, it's not insane. Um, but when you have these huge pumps, it's just natural to have these dumps down. That's just how the markets work, right? So to me, uh, the next phase right now when we're having these crazy pullbacks isn't to look down and try to find a $5 million market cap coin. It's to look up and try to see which coins have been performing amazingly, which coins look like they have a clear through line utility and users. They have great tech and they're going to be providing utility to elevate the space. And so if you see that in a coin and you see a tremendous dump, then I would see that as a great opportunity. Of course, there is a macro outlook that we should talk about, right? There's a macro uh, outlook that we will talk about. Kusama is another one that I hope uh, could cool off a little bit, but it doesn't. It's literally at all-time highs. And uh, Mantra Dow again, I just talked about. A little cool off, but we'll see. You know, It could settle in uh, at the lower part of the range. So now I'm going to bring my webcam up for sort of a macro breakdown of what I see going on here, the potential outcomes and of course, then I'll go to answer some questions. Yeah, I'll talk about sand. Um, okay, so what we have here is, I believe, evidence that the actual total crypto community hasn't grown as much as the money within the community has been repurposed to create a ton of pumps, create new activity, new life. And that new life may very well bring in 
a tremendous amount of new investment into the space and new, new uh, people network effect. But we're not there yet. And so you have the macro story where sound money is now becoming something people think about. People are now thinking about, well, why can't they just pay us more money if they can print all the money? Why do I have to pay taxes if they can just print all the money? All of these thoughts are things that literally I'll hear about as I'm walking down to get food or whatever. I'm hearing normal people, non-finance bros, non-crypto heads talk about these concepts. And I do feel like we're in a, a place where financial literacy is growing. And so I think there's a huge potential that one of two situations happen, and both of these are good for crypto. There's only a third situation that's not good for crypto, but I don't think it's as likely as one of the first two. So let's start with these two situations. The first situation is we get more stimulus, right? And that's going to pretty much pump everyone's bags across the board from the stock market to the crypto world to the gold markets. Everyone's going to see increased values because essentially cash is just getting cheaper. We're going to see, uh, and that stimulus is most likely going to happen because there's political will for it on both sides. The other potential is that we don't get stimulus, the economy doesn't recover, and we see mass defaults on loans. We see a essential house of cards start to collapse because of derivatives and aggressive and malicious banking practices. And if that happens, if we experience a banking collapse, sort of like we did in 2008, where we have way less uh, safeguards on the economy than we did back then, then that could essentially drive a lot of people into Bitcoin. But I don't think that's a world that everyone wants to live in, where essentially we have mass rioting and people lining up to try to get their food stamps and get their handouts from the government. That is not something that I think we want to see play out, as much as that would most likely lead to a million dollar Bitcoin in the short term future. I think it would be a pretty, uh, it would be a low uh, uh, that million dollars wouldn't buy you very much in that world. And it would also be, I think, a very traumatic uh, point in history to live through. And who knows, maybe that would be a trauma that would end up benefiting humanity in the long run. But I think it would be uh, something that I don't necessarily want to see manifest, right? This whole uh, banks failing uh, rush into uh, gold, silver, and crypto, I, I don't want to see a total collapse of our modern world. I think that would be a little bit jarring, right? The third situation is that we have a lackluster recovery to the economy. We get some stimulus, but then the stimulus stops and we get some political gridlock and we see all markets take a big step down. That would be the third situation that would essentially be the question of are we at the top of this bull run? And I see a lot of people starting to get a little bit tired of the DeFi, new DeFi trash projects. Makes everybody feel like, hey, <clears throat> This can't go on very much longer. This reminds us of 2017 where just trash projects flooding the space. And so if that's where we are already, the question is, is this the top, right? That's what people are wondering with Chainlink topping and a few other coins topping. Everyone's saying, oh, is this the top? No, I don't believe so, right? I personally really hope not. Uh, but that would be what I would consider the very lower percent chance. The higher percent chance is that we get more stimulus, the bull run continues, and that we see what happens after the election, right? And so to me, there's a high likelihood of significant stimulus. If the stimulus doesn't happen, then we could see a banking sort of issue happen, and that would also drive a lot of people into crypto and alternative assets. But also, there is the possibility that this DeFi-fueled wave, which I've said on every single episode, uh, has reached its apex. And I just don't really want to live in that world. I don't believe that's where we are. I still, until proven otherwise, just think this is a normal correction. Remember, bull runs tend to correct tremendously upwards of 30% or more many times throughout the bull run. And that's beco those become the best buying opportunities, right? Because you've seen into the future, right? And now you can buy the dip, as they say. And so I'm approaching this until I get other information until I see tremendous signs that the actual markets are collapsing. And to me, even going down and retesting 9,000 or whatever, that's not necessarily proof to me because there's also the CME gaps down there and there's sort of that you know Illuminati uh, conspiracy theory that you need the gaps filled. And so you know until, until proven otherwise, which would take a lot for me, I'm gonna go ahead and you know keep believing that this bull run is just taking a very healthy, breather, a healthy relaxation point. And in this breather, the best thing to do is to buy that dip on the best coin. So that's my strategy. Hope you guys enjoyed it. There's 1,200 people in here at one point. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. So do me a favor and smash that like button if you guys are enjoying this episode. 
415 likes, almost 1,200 people in here. Come on, guys, let's smash the like. Now I want to respond to some questions. So go ahead and put some questions in here. I hope I didn't miss any super chats. Um, nope. Go ahead and put your questions in here. I'm going to get a quick little glass of water, and then I will answer your questions. It'll take me just a snap. All right, all right, all right. 12.08, feels great. All right, guys, bring me a beer. Amen, brother. Look at those feet. Yeah, those are my feet. Bitcoin is looking toppy. Eh. Fastest animal. I don't even know what any of these mean. We got a real question? All right. I legitimately haven't seen a real question. How come everybody changes their strategy one day after one bad day uh, after spending a month or two saying it's the start of the bull run? Uh, well, I'm not changing my strategy, right? I still think it's the bull run. Uh, I'm just saying that every week, every day, every second, crypto changes, right? Look at the price. It changes every second. So when you see a trend of, okay, last week we got revolutionary projects like Daya. This week, we're getting revolutionary trash like yams and, you know, other ones. I don't want to name a bunch and offend people, but I'm seeing a lot more trash and people talking about trash and trash actually getting a lot of traction. So my strategy is to stop looking at the new projects because I'm not seeing a lot of new quality. And I believe that right now, as the market kind of takes a breather, it's a great opportunity to get better entries into projects that have proven that they're legit. And I used Swipe SXP as a great example because there's kind of no denying that that project has a big future. Backed by Binance, biggest comparison, CRO and Crypto.com, which by the way, if you guys want to get a free $50 off and you're not signed up for Crypto.com, I love their product. I love their card. If you want to sign up, links in the description. Shout out to Crypto.com. Uh, you'll get $50 free for signing up. Uh, but uh, Crypto.com CRO is a multi-billion dollar coin. I think it's over $3 billion. Swipe, just a few hundred million. It has an easy 10x to catch up. And it looks like they're going to be doing all of the things that uh, Crypto.com is doing. So, Yeah, uh, exactly, guys. I'm, not, I'm actually not drinking a beer. This is water. This is just water. But this is uh, actually my grandpa. I inherited this from my grandpa. This is actually a stock market, Dow Jones Industrial Average. You can see uh, it's got the stock market here on this uh, rocks glass. Uh, I love whiskey. Whiskey's kind of like my thing. Uh, lately, if you guys are uh, educated in the art of whiskeys, I have here uh, a Balvini 21. This has been my sort of, when I'm having a really, I want to take a nice day and I want to really enjoy myself, pour myself a little Balvini. Um, otherwise, I'm working on a Highland Park 12 is sort of my everyday drinker. All right. Uh, does that answer your question, guys, as to things change on a micro level, but on a macro level, they don't. Bitcoin is still Bitcoin, right? Ethereum is still Ethereum, and DeFi is still DeFi. But how you navigate it from day to day changes. Buying Swipe at $5, maybe not a great strategy. Buying Swipe at $1, buying Swipe at $2, maybe a great strategy. So understanding that the overall macro strategy doesn't change, but the micro strategy, of course that changes. It has to change. And so if you don't respect that, you don't think that that's a valid way to navigate, then you're just an, unfortunately a bit of a noob, right? Things change so fast in crypto that you have to be on the ball at all times. You have to be willing to put in the time and do the research at all times, or else you're going to miss it. Excellent whiskey. Thank you. McCallum. Nice. Thank you. I like a Yamazaki. I do, but I, I, I much prefer the whiskeys I just uh, rattled off. Anchor is good for long term. I think Anchor is good as long as you have these other blockchains. 
uh, spinning up and Anchor makes it easy to uh, host nodes and, and become, it makes everybody stronger, right? That's what I like about Anchor. Can DeFi be considered a big bubble at this point? Just like Adam Back said. So first of all, Adam Back is a maxi. And that's okay to be a maximalist. Believe what you want to believe. But Adam Back also thinks Ethereum is a scam, right? So do you think Ethereum's a scam? Do you, like, come on. Ethereum is a revolutionary piece of technology. Whether or not it's perfect, whether or not it's ready for mass adoption, different questions. But to pretend like it's a scam, that's like the, the OG Bitcoiners are kind of like, if you guys know who Peter Schiff is, the new Bitcoiners are essentially millennial Peter Schiffs, right? Where they are just against like a lot of things and bless them bitcoin is a very critical part of our ecosystem but i can tell you as a product person nobody cares so we need products and DeFi is a product that makes better use of bitcoin than it was being used before and in the future uh web 3 i believe is going to be a you know the same kind of it's going to support the same amount of people as web 2 which is our mobile web which everybody uses web 3 is the internet of money and the internet of money is going to put cryptocurrency and and money protectable assets into all of the products we know and love in intelligent ways and so web 3 to me is the big vision and who knows maybe it's going to take us 15 20 years to get there i don't think it will and so that's what I work every day towards, is the vision for a Web3 economy. And the potential for that is, is, is almost limitless as far as economic opportunity. So Adam Back uh, saying that DeFi is a big bubble, well, who knows? DeFi could, like The DeFi euphoria could wear off, but essentially loaning and lending and, and having these mechanisms is going to be around here. Yield farming and liquidity mining and those mechanisms are going to continue to be around. And uh, that, there's just no two ways about that. Whether or not you believe in, uh, in Ethereum or DeFi, these are just sensible mechanisms and it's part of the ecosystem evolving. What are your thoughts on DIA, its price range and potential timeline? So... As you guys know, I was one of the first people to talk about Daya. I love the project. Uh, I'm waiting for them to drop some more meaningful uh, uh, partnerships. I'm waiting for them to announce some bigger exchanges. They were just listed on KuCoin, so that was gave them a nice pump. But again, I'm already sitting on you know three, four hundred percent gains on Daya. So I'm waiting. I, I I believe personally, my target for them is ten dollars. I believe it'll make it there if this bull run continues. Um, but again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the gain so far. I'm also not in a rush because I see, you know, the band narrative, the, like I said on my video this morning, narratives are very important. Narratives are critical to how people give value and assess value for cryptocurrencies. Remember the primary use of cryptocurrencies is speculation. And so if we know that one very similar asset is worth 10, 100 X, what this other asset is worth. Well, it makes it look like this one could gain a lot of value, whether or not their real world values are, are actually uh, equated to that or not. The reality is right now, it's very hard to distinctively or to essentially empirically define what a blockchain's value is because you're buying an asset based on its value tomorrow, not today, as I explained this morning. So that's my DIA breakdown. Love DIA. Uh, ETH is not a scam. scam. Yeah, of course. Can Polkadot kill ETH? I don't think Polkadot kills ETH. I think Polkadot is to Ethereum as DeFi is to Bitcoin. DeFi just gives Bitcoin a better use case and makes it more functional, right? DeFi, if anything, pumps Bitcoin's bags a bit. And of course, in the future, people are not just going to hold Bitcoin. They're going to, you know, uh, farm with it. They're going to get returns on it because any sensible investor would. And so I think Polkadot then takes Ethereum and makes it uh, a much more high performance blockchain. And it keeps that security, that underlying trust and security that Ethereum has built and it maximizes its functionality. And it essentially allows for Ethereum ERC-20 assets and Ethereum protocols and, and smart contracts to get scalability and, and to get more interoperability with other networks. So I think Polkadot doesn't kill ETH. I think Polkadot will make ETH better. And I think if anything, they'll play together and then, of course, uh, Polkadot may eventually become bigger than ETH, 
but it won't. But to say it kills ETH would imply that ETH would then uh, decline. I think Polkadot doesn't lead to a decline in ETH, if that makes sense. I think Polkadot might rise tremendously, may even become bigger than ETH at one point. But to say that it's an ETH killer, I think is the wrong approach. Polkadot is an ETH maximizer. It's like, uh, I like my initial statement. Polkadot is to Ethereum as DeFi is to Bitcoin. What do I think about ICX? I was always, I was like an ICX maximalist back in the day. It's just hard. I haven't seen a tremendous amount of uh, movement from them. Uh, I follow their founder on Twitter. Uh, by the way, if you guys aren't following me on Twitter, I highly encourage you guys. Lots of great one-liners. Lots of one-liners. Links in the description. Really appreciate the honesty and straightforwardness. Thank you, Pot of Gold. It's my pleasure. You know, uh, I have been in this industry a while. I've seen a lot of characters come and go, and my goal is to be here for the long term. I'm also launching my own project. Uh, I've been building it for about two years now. You guys will hear about that uh, in the coming days next month. And so that's been my main focus. After I do content for about eight hours a day research, I do another eight hours a day of uh, development and planning, uh, overseeing management, financial compliance, all that stuff for my project. Uh, and it gives me a great sense of pride to create things of value. And so if I can make uh, one or two people better off and smarter and, and more capable of handling this crypto world, then that brings me joy. And of course, uh, you know, if I can create a project that actually breaks the mold and uh, what I think is the most important thing. If you notice throughout this episode, I was talking about Metcalf's Law, people outside crypto not joining, the actual community and network effect not building and that being part of the uh, the big issue here. And so my project is aimed at solving that. And so I'll, I'll be unleashing what I, what I believe is an amazing uh, vehicle to achieve that very soon. You guys will see it. Um, do I think Korean blocks gone hype? I don't know what that means. If you're asking whether a Korean blockchain community is still excited about crypto, definitely not like in 2017 when they were paying double for Ripple. I don't know if you guys remember that. They called it the kimchi premium. Uh, where you essentially have people in Korea paying ridiculous premiums to get uh, into cryptos. It didn't make any sense. Nimic no more? No, I like Nimic. I really like Nimic. Um, you know, I talk with their team a lot. Uh, I have a relationship with their project, and their tech is great. Um, I'm trying to work with them to figure out how to articulate the next phase of their vision to the public. Um, but they have some interesting tech coming down the line that is not yet out. But I think it's going to be a, a really positive thing for the space, again, with a bunch of other people who are doing uh, interoperability and payments. ETH talk the talk, BTC walk the walk. Amen, brother. I also think uh, ETH walk the walk. I mean, I think Ethereum has been pretty incredible over the last few years. They've really withstood a lot of the, the drama and the negativity. Let me catch up here. Um, all right. Any ideas on when PCX will pump? Yeah, you know, uh, like I said, I see PCX as one of the first movers in, in the Polkadot uh, community. They're clearly very respected by the other Polkadot chains. Acropolis has nothing but the best things to say about P uh, Polkadot chain X, PCX. And so while Ren is one of my darlings and will be integrated into uh, Polkadot at one point, PCX is the first mover, and we know first movers tend to command a lot of uh, a lot of clout a lot of essentially first movers get rewarded look at uniswap it's going to be hard to replace uniswap helio coin pretty much thank you for taking <clears throat> thank you for taking the time to explain in detail your realistic approach and your expectations you're probably the only crypto channel speaking realism versus optimism your facts and direction have given focus Thanks, guys. Uh, sweet as music. I appreciate that. Uh, I have a long history in the startup tech community. I've been doing this, building stuff for a very long time, uh, over 12 years myself, as well as my partner, my mentor. Now my partner, you know, he was my boss. When I first met him, he hired me, uh, mentored me, gave me skill sets, taught me uh, the, the way things were really done, not the way you think things are done. And that's the truth about internet entrepreneurship is not everything is actually almost nothing is as you would imagine it. That's why traditional marketers, traditional product guys, they tend to get absolutely creamed on the internet. And you see the same thing happening here in blockchain, where there's a mismatch between the sort of uh, push approach versus what cryptocurrencies are fundamentally 
our internet communities. And understanding that cryptocurrencies are communities, that they are groups of people, then you need to understand how do you market and build a community. It's a very different approach than you would to say selling, you know, whiskey glasses or socks, right? And that's what's something that I think a lot of people have failed to grasp. And you're even seeing a huge failure uh, on the mainstream wave of things like Grayscale, Bitcoin Trust, and Ethereum Trust. They're running just kind of like ads, right? You saw the Alec Baldwin ads for eToro, and who knows, maybe those convert, right? But the point is, this isn't bringing crypto mainstream. That's not what brings crypto mainstream. And so, you know, my goal is to use my understanding of product, my understanding of internet communities. Uh, you know, my partner built uh, multiple communities in excess of 30 million users, and we know uh, what makes for a healthy, long-lasting community, and we hope to apply that expertise uh, here in crypto land. So you'll be hearing all about that. Um, if BTC can't stay over 11.4, Chainlink is in trouble. Maybe. What do you think about near protocol? Seems interesting. I haven't done a deep dive. Anchor is good for the long term. Didn't we just see this question? Is this Anchor is good for the long time. Are you spamming? Could you stop spamming? I'm actually going to put you on timeout. You're on timeout, brother. I need to get a moderator in here, I'm sure. Question, what do you think about Robonomics? So like I said, Robonomics, very low cap Polkadot ecosystem project, lots of bells and whistles, connections, integrations. The thing is robotics is just not the current way that we're living our lives. It's very close. Maybe in the next five years, we're going to be living in a much more robo uh, driven world with drones and everything in your house is, is AI, robotics. It's just not the world we're living in, right? We, you, could, you could make an argument that the iPhone's a robot and stuff, but I would just say the Robonomics approach, I think, is just a little ahead of its time. And I had a big wave of investing into AI projects at the beginning of my crypto journey, especially in 2017. I got heavy into a lot of AI projects, and they're just too early. They're just too early. So that's what I would say is I would focus on things that can have mass adoption today. And uh, yeah, buy a bag of, of Robonomics, but I don't see it as uh, having the utility today. Um, let's see, what do you guys think of token metrics indices? Uh, yeah, I've been, like I said, I use token metrics as a backup tool. I try to emphasize that. It's not a silver bullet, but I do really enjoy having a variety of tools to analyze the market. So I've found that to be helpful as a backup tool. Once I've done my fundamental analysis, once I've done my tokenomics analysis, once I've used my gut and my intuition, I'll go in and see what the AI is saying about the price action, because I've found that it actually is, is pretty accurate, some of those price predictions. Hi, Elliot. Thanks for the content. One question. What is happening to Koti? You know something? Uh, I don't. I don't. <laughs> I don't know anything about Koti. I, I know that it's a good project, good payments coin. Uh, last I heard was all positive, but I don't have any secret information and I haven't done any deep dives in the last week. That would give me an edge over you guys. Have you looked into DAP evolution? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're funny. From Japan, want to say thank you for your quality. You stay humble when you present, and that's such a wonderful strength. Thank you, the fitness doctor. I appreciate it. Sending my love over the seas. MYX is not a scam, is a Ponzi. I don't know what you're saying there. Will BTC achieve 380K? 380K Satoshis? Or 380K uh, US dollars? Yeah, who knows? You know, <laughs> like. Anyone can say yes or no to that. It's it's meaningless. We need to see the macro climate. We need to see if this bull run keeps shaping up like the last bull runs. If this bull run is anything like the last bull runs and you guys are here now, you're going to be sitting pretty, right? As long as you just hold on, right? Uh, and that's why I sort of try to encourage people to invest money they can afford to lose in crypto because having money that you need for your life can be way too stressful because the ups are way too high. The highs are too high and the lows are too low. And that's not healthy for an investor. An investor should be dispassionate and logical. And so if you're investing money that you can't afford to lose, you're not going to be dispassionate and logical. Luxo, I almost made a video on Luxo and then I saw Chico made two on it this week. Uh, and so I just wanna be having my content be a little more original. But it's interesting, right? I'm not big on like fashion plays, but it does seem like they have a bunch of heavy hitters in the lifestyle world on board, uh, big heads at Instagram and luxury brands. And so, yeah, I think they could have, I think they could have a big reception. Uh, time will tell, right? Time will tell. Uh, but remember, I was saying there was kind of a race to the bottom to be the first ones to unearth these gems. And so, yeah, when I see another influencer that's really big uh, make two episodes on a coin, sometimes I just like to 
stay away from that. I don't want it to seem, there's also a perception sometimes that influencers are collaborating with each other. And while I'm friends with a lot of these people, I do not collaborate with anyone on my content. And I do not want uh, other people's input on my content because I don't think that I can do my best work if I have someone else's sort of opinions rattling around my brain. So that's sort of how I approach my own content, but everyone obviously has their own approach. What do you think about Strong, David A? So actually Strong is, uh, I've been going back and forth on Strong. I love the actual project. I really love what they're doing. There's just question marks that I need answered before I put a big uh, investment in. And we'll have answers to that in the coming days. So my biggest thing is uh, tokenomics, that I wanna see them release their tokenomics. But the project itself is kind of genius. It's, it's a very smart project. Put out by a bunch of sort of old school tech guys. Uh, the only thing is I just, do not know if the the token, I don't know if it's going to have the growth that their actual business might have. And so I think it's very important to understand that just because you have a great business, you want to make sure that the tokenomics are set to grow with that ecosystem. And right now, the strong ecosystem is very, very interesting. DeFi uh, with a purpose, as they're calling it, where they're giving a DeFi reward system for setting up nodes. It essentially makes blockchain infrastructure stronger, better, more performant. However, then you also have the idea that there's only 30,000 of these tokens floating around out of the 6 million that are supposed to be uh, you know, in this particular sort of uh, allocation that's not the rewards pool. They have a 4 million rewards pool and 6 million that's not the rewards pool. But of that 6 million, there's only 30,000 that we have access to now. And so I'm just wondering, you know, where's that 5.97 million? And is that really all for team and investors? So uh, I actually was talking to the CEO. I'm curious, I'm interested in the project, but I haven't put my name behind it because there's question marks that I need answered before I, uh, I put my stamp on it. PCX, where is it best bought and stored? Now buying PCX is a nightmare. You have to go to exchanges like Hotbit, uh, exchanges you don't really want to be on. And so I got in and out on Hotbit and I'm storing it on Math Wallet, which is a mobile wallet. What do I think about Koti? Good project. I just talked about it. Link will come back 18 September. Artan uh, Arifi. All right, everyone. Artan Arifi says 18th of September, Link will come back. Everybody mark their calendars. Everybody mark it. Rip Crypto. It's a carnage. <laughs> Doesn't make sense. Uh, what's your opinion about Fetch AI? Uh, yeah, it's a good project. Honestly, I haven't really researched it for another year. Uh, it's, I was hearing about it back in 2019 or, or even earlier. So, Big Yourself Mon. Your market analysis is greatly appreciated. Keep up the good work, Mon. Thank you, Andre Sinclair. Thank you, Mon. Uh, okay, Hotbit sucks. Yeah, not a big fan. What's my thought on PRQ, new competition to Daya? Um, PRQ's been on my list of to be researched. I'll let you guys know. I'll let you guys know what I come out with on PRQ. Um, interested, but again, uh, question marks. I need to get to the bottom of it. If you guys haven't noticed, uh, a lot of these coins, they don't pass my sniff test. So I try to make sure that I do a lot of thorough research before bringing them to you, especially now that the channel has grown so big. Like we literally are getting a thousand subscribers a day. Uh, some days I got over 2000 subscribers a day. Uh, if you guys aren't subscribed, I highly encourage you to subscribe and hit that bell notification because I've been, you know, like I said, the, when I put out a coin review, when I put out a coin pick, they've been doing extremely well. And that's because my formula is based upon a uh, tremendous amount of research, a tremendous amount of due diligence, and then a tremendous amount of personal experience that I have in this wild internet world. So uh, I encourage you guys, if, you, if you're interested in being the first ones to know when I do put my name behind a coin and I say this one's going to go, I highly encourage you to su subscribe and make sure you have that bell notification on or else you'll be the last one to know. That's no fun. Hi, I appreciate your content. Could you comment on Tezos, VeChain, Digibyte, Chili's, Share Token for the long term? Could you, uh, which one? Which one? Which one? Uh, yeah, uh, let's just do Chili's. I'm just going to pick one. I love Chili's. I love soccer. I love uh, football, if you will. I love all of the stuff they're doing to tokenize sort of the fan world. I think that that's going to be a big opportunity. Uh, they haven't pumped very much, so you know I've been wanting to get their founder on, uh, Alexander Dreyfus, to do an interview just because he seems like an interesting dude. Being able to create these partnerships is not easy. Uh, and yeah, I mean, they've made some huge partnerships, right? Like partnered with FC Barcelona and Real Madrid and, and all these amazing soccer clubs that have hundreds of millions of followers. So I'm, I'm big on respecting what they've done. 
uh, and I want to know more about their plans for the future. So if you see this Alexander Dreyfus, come on the show. Come have a chat. Stop asking. What do you think about sand? Okay, so sand, uh, the thing about sand is it's part of the sandbox, which is actually a very old game. Uh, and yes, they're doing their blockchain integration, but it's been out for like eight years, I think, or, or several years. It's kind of like a pixel art or a, what do they call it, voxel game. Yeah, I think it's cool, right? I'm big on video game plays because I actually, as you'll find out, uh, have a video game play I've been working on, right? And so I believe in this space. Uh, do I know if Sand's going to be the one to do it? I'm not quite sure. I think they might have overpriced uh, their offering because essentially fully diluted their coin supply is like upwards of $300 million in value, which I just think is a, a little much, right? And so we'll see how they do it. We'll see how they progress. Uh, but I'm not buying Sand right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see how they go, right? If it actually adds, I want to see if the users are really buying these assets trading, if, if the token economy takes off from genuine usage. Uh, because they are a very legit project, right? They're a legit video games project. I just want to see how's their usage, their metrics, uh, following the actual integrations of blockchain. I want to see. Uh, I want to see that through line, right? And uh, it's the same reason why I'm not bullish on ETHverse, even though I am bullish on video games. Uh, I just think ETHverse. I saw a similar project out of uh, out of Engine. They had EngineCraft, and so you know. They shut that down, EngineCraft, I think, as far as I understand, and they had millions of users. So ETHverse to me just seems like kind of like the dollar store version of that. And uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not bullish on on that project. And so Sand is is a much better version than you know potentially like ETHverse. Uh, but I'm gonna I'm on a wait and see with Sand right now. I'm gonna wait and see. Thoughts on Darwinian? Yeah, again, uh, I think that's Ring, right? Darwinian network token, Ring and Katon. Big, big fan of what they're doing. Big fan of what they're doing. That's a great example of a coin that I would like to size up an entry to during this dip, right? Assuming that the bull run continues, again, like I said, no crystal ball, but assuming it does continue, Dar uh, Darwinian Network Token and Ring and Katon, those are tokens I could see going up tremendously, right? Tremendously. Um, 990, 939, guys, if you guys haven't smashed the likes, do me a favor and smash the likes. I'd really appreciate it. Thoughts on Hyper, how do? So I'm actually going to be comparing all of the crypto social platforms soon, and I'll give you guys a compare and contrast. That way you guys can make up your own mind. Big drops in cryptos mentioned by you, Chai, Band, uh, Chi, Band, TRB, PCX, Ren. What's the point? What is your point of view? Will they bounce back up? Well, there's big drops in every crypto this week. Uh, there's a big, crop, uh, big drop in every crypto, right? And REN didn't drop. REN's higher than when I talked about it yesterday, uh, the other day. And it's over triple, it's like double or triple when I first started talking about it. So yeah, there's been a slight drop. But again, guys, like if you're coming in and you, you're literally only taking a 24 hour or, tw or 72 hour time frame on this, then I appreciate, I, I, would, I would urge you guys to do a lot of research because that's a very noobtastic approach. And it sounds like you're very new to the space. Uh, if you're not understanding that these coins have gone up like 100x this year and that any coin that goes up 100x is going to come down at some point and have retests and that those retests actually create what they call support lines on the chart. So there is TA in crypto. TA is real. It happens. It can be used. And you need essentially lines of support and resistance. Support is a place where the, the price can actually bounce and, and gain support. And so when a coin comes up, goes up like crazy and then comes down and starts bouncing off of areas, those bounces create support lines. And those are very important for long-term sustainability of the price. <clears throat> Dude, do you see what's happening with coins? Talk about this. <laughs> Yeah, 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 I see what's happening with the coins. Thank you for that comment. That made me laugh. Uh, spam MYX some more. No, I'm, I'm done with MYX. Like I said, guys, I, try, I did a video that was not as positively received as my other videos, but I knew it was going to get hate because in the end, there are coins that have utilities that cannot be easily copied, products, ecosystems that cannot be easily knocked off, and then there are coins, like people always say, well, Bitcoin's been cloned a bunch of, t a bunch of times, and, and so you could claim that Bitcoin's just a clone, and it's just tokenomics. No, guys. Bitcoin is a network. Bitcoin is a system of nodes and validators, and it has a hash rate and a security model that is leagues ahead of everything else in the crypto space. So Bitcoin cannot be copied. It cannot be copied. 
However, your ERC-20 smart contract pump coin, which shall remain nameless, can easily be copied because you're not actually the Ethereum network. Again, Ethereum can't just be copied, right? Because it's a network. So you have uh, things that can be copied and things that can't be copied. And when you're looking at just a pure tokenomics play and you're saying this is just good tokenomics and it's here on Ethereum, it's always a little dangerous, right? Because you can always just have essentially that ship get so big that for it to grow would mean that it needs that much more percentage growth in new money. And in that event, it's easier for people to kind of clone the project and then create a 10x growth by getting that project from $1 million to $10 million when the other thing's already at $150 million. You know, we saw this, unfortunately, with Ampleforth, which I loved that project when I first found out about it. And, you know, it, it just got cloned so many times that essentially people created even arguably better versions of the tokenomics. And that's why even when they released great news today, it didn't pump the bags, right? And so, you know, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. I want to always tell you guys positive things. And, you know, like I said, I did two, three follow-up videos on Ampleforth where I talked about buying the dip after it crashed. And then I told you that I was going to sell a big stack of my Ample to lighten my uh, exposure to the asset. And then the next day it pumped like 80% and I sold a bunch. And so I ended up not losing very much on my Ample. I did lose a little bit, but I didn't lose very much because I, I, and I, and I literally in real time explained my strategy, but you know, I still got lit up. A lot of people didn't like that I was so excited about Ample, uh, even though I made three pieces of content that week about it and, and gave you a live time way to navigate it. I understand people get frustrated. People don't always tune into all the videos. Again, a reason why you should be subscribed with the bell on because then you would have been informed. Um, but MYX, MYX is just a pump coin in my opinion. Uh, MYX is just, uh, I call them DGEN pump coins because essentially all they're good for is pumps. There's no inherent value, right? It's just a tokenomics that's designed to essentially create more of something out of nothing. And, and that can happen, right? As long as there's more new people in. But as soon as the new people stop, it, it, uh, it goes down. All right. What do I think about Gobernance on Polkadot? Is it valuable to bribe? I, I don't, I don't <laughs> I'm not sure I understand this question. Hey, what do you have to say about SXP dumping? Yeah, I actually did about a 30 minute segment on SXP, so go ahead and rewind. Okay, I talked about Acropolis yesterday. Okay, I think we're running out of new questions here, so I think I might call it a day here, guys. But I really enjoyed talking with you guys. I think this has been a great uh, great live here, over an hour long. I didn't realize how long we were going. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope you guys have had a phenomenal day, phenomenal week. I hope you guys are ready to have a very relaxing, a very healthy, and very restful weekend. Go ahead and take some peace of mind. Again, like I said, to summarize the content before that just happened, there's a macro outlook where we could see potentially a serious issue, a serious collapse of the banking infrastructure. At that time, Bitcoin will go absolutely bonkers. 100,000 is nothing. If the banking system has a true moment of collapse, we're going to be looking at probably, I think, several hundred thousand dollars to a million dollar Bitcoin. Uh, again, is that a world we want to live in? Probably not. Then there's also the possibility of us getting uh, more stimulus. If that stimulus hits, I believe this altcoin gravy train keeps going. Uh, and yeah, there is a big question as to whether uh, DeFi is actually bringing in new people or not. We're going to find out those answers to that in the coming days. Uh, but I've started to really uh, stop looking for these tiny little trash DeFi projects because it's become a race to the bottom. And I'm looking for entries into bigger major coins like Swipe, like Ren, like the big majors, uh, you know, look at the DeFi blue chips. And that's what I'm looking at uh, over the course of the next few days as the market takes a breather and, and starts to correct from the amazing run we've been on over the past few weeks. Um, I did a little segment on liquidity pools and how they can uh, increase your yields from your altcoins on Uniswap. I hope you guys enjoyed all this. I hope it benefited you. Again, if it did, I highly encourage you guys to smash that like button. If you guys want to follow me and, and catch more impulsive pieces of content, I encourage you to follow me on Twitter, at LEO Trades. And of course, if you guys want to join my Telegram group, the links for both my Twitter and Telegram are in the description. And you can connect with me in a much more personal way. And I really love chatting with the community. So if you guys want to get a hold of me, you can follow those links and you can find me there. 
Of course, if you guys are not subscribed, I highly encourage you to hit that sub button and don't forget to hit that little bell notification. That way you're the first to be aware when I put out new content. As always, I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. My name's Elio Trades.